We're very happy to have Walter with us tonight. Three-time Academy Award winning. Yeah. I'm gonna let the stage become Walter's stage now. Ladies and gentlemen, please, a warm welcome for Walter Murch. Thank you. It's, uh, it's great to be in Boston. My mom was raised in Auburndale, just over here, and my dad taught painting at the art department at Boston University. My sister lives in Cambridge, so I feel a real connection with Boston. I thought I'd open with this, not that it uh, talks uh, about specifically what we're going to talk about tonight, but it you know, this is Victor Fleming was the guy who directed Gone with the Wind and Wizard of Oz. He wrote, he said this sometime in 1939. As much as everything has changed, and it's changed a tremendous amount, this observation uh, that is really kind of basic uh, in the sense that the, the craft of editing can occasionally and we all try to do this as, as much as we can, and it's whether we achieve it or not is down in large part to luck. But when something is, is, has great editing, you don't notice it, and you don't even notice that the film is directed. It's not a thing uh, that is made by people. It's just things are happening up there, and you're part of it. Um, so in, in everything that we're going to be talking tonight, this is kind of the, the, the under... Uh, pinnings of it all. Uh, another thing is good to keep in mind, which is that motion pictures plus montage, which is really what I like to think of as editing, the putting together of things, equals cinema. So the art of what we call film or cinema uh, is these two things together because they were, they evolved separately. Motion pictures got invented in the 1890s, uh, and, but nobody who invented it ever thought of putting these images together to, in complex ways to tell long, uh, interesting, compelling stories. That only began to be invented at the beginning of the 1900s. Um, so just another thing to keep in mind, these, these two things are really separate things, and editing is of all the crafts of film is the most specific to film. Um, everything else, photography, uh, costume, makeup, acting, script, uh, are, are all have long histories that go back into the dawn of time. So, but whereas editing is almost within the lifespan of a single human being. Margaret Booth, uh, who died just a few years ago at age over 100, was the negative cutter on Birth of a Nation for D.W. Griffith. So, you know, she lived the entire 20th century. She was born in the 19th century and was one of the preeminent film editors of the 20th century, starting with uh, Birth of a Nation. Two words will kind of uh, circle around uh, uh, today are uh, lovely sounding word, fungibility. Um, which just means the ability of to, to change one thing into another, the, the kind of shape-shifting or alchemy uh, of things. It's used a lot in economics, uh, but it, it applies especially to what's going on right now. And then metadata, which uh, you know, I assure you uh, are uh, uh, overly aware of it now, but you will become even more aware of it in the years to come. There have been three big shifts in uh, human society in the last 600 years, um, all relating to this concept of fungibility. The concept of money, which is to say bank accounts, um, which is to say the invention of the economy that we live in now, whether it's capitalist or socialist, it all depends on this idea of things having value. Um, and that you can transform that value into an abstract number and exchange it for something else based on that number. Power, which is to say energy, 
uh, electricity, the cracking of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum in the 1900s, in the 1800s, really taking hold in 1900, and then information. Uh, that, that electricity was the first time that we had this fungibility in terms of energy. You made it, and then here was a wire, what do you want to do with it? You can do anything with it. You can use it to uh, boil tea, you can use it to run a motor, you can use it to make a telephone call. Um, it's up to you how you use it. It's, it's energy in its purest state. And then information that the digitization of information, which we're right in the middle of now, is this third great fungibility where we can take data and turn them into digits and then press to digitize with them, turning them into something else, rearranging them uh, easily. And if you want to know what, what, was, what did it feel like to be on the cusp of the emerging electrification of the world in 1911, it feels exactly like, or it felt exactly like it feels now with the digitization of information. And the story is by no means uh, over. It's not even really begun yet. We, we have no idea where this is gonna go. But you think of these three things, money and energy and information, these are basic uh, commodities uh, with which the wor on which the world turns and they're this ability to turn them into things that allow them this greater and greater flexibility is a tremendously important uh, shift in um, our experience. An unfungible uh, <laughs> thing was me in 1978 editing Apocalypse Now, uh, <laughs> caught up in the tendrils of this uh, <laughs> caught up in the tendrils of this uh, jungle of film that was threatening to drown us uh, all. Um, it's worth remembering, just on this level, that this stuff weighed things. <laughs> that uh, 11 minutes of 35 millimeter film weighed 11 pounds, so you had a pound a minute. So Apocalypse Now, <laughs> 14,000. So there were seven tons of work print that we had to hump back and forth, uh, there were five or six rooms full of this stuff, and it was not fungible. It was what it was, uh, and you had to take care of it, and otherwise it got scratched or damaged or, you know, it, it, uh, it was a substance that uh, was wonderful, but not, uh, it didn't have this fantastic quality that we have today where the information uh, uh, the, the two films ago, uh, Tetro, Francis's film, had not quite, but almost, probably 10,000 minutes, but it didn't weigh anything, you know? It was just <laughs> ones and zeros, and you could fit it on some bunch of terabyte drives. So this is a fundamental shift in how we approach things. This, speaking of power, this was, uh, I was in London a couple of days ago. This is, uh, used to be a power station, it's now the, Modern Museum of Art, the Tate uh, Modern in London, and they had a, uh, what I guess was a celebration, uh, but it had a kind of a uh, melancholy aspect to it, a celebration of physical film by the artist Tacita Dean, and she was invited to light up the, what's this central hall, a turbine hall in, at the museum. Um, and she was celebrating the physicality of film, which she felt correctly is uh, uh, under threat. She's trying to keep it around for a while. It was a great hit. Uh, it's, it's ongoing. I think it's there till March. Uh, people uh, come and look at this stuff. Uh, the kids love it. And...
but it's on its way out. It's, uh, this, this monolith is kind of like a tombstone. Technicolor has gone out of the film business. Kodak is contemplating bankruptcy. Uh, Panavision and ARRI are no longer making film cameras. And the, um, this company in Chicago, the, the Lavezzi Corporation that made sprockets, is now out of business. So all of the hardware, the, 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 the substance itself and the things to manipulate it are disappearing from um, our lives. And you know, is this a good thing or a bad thing or is it inevitable? What, how should we relate to this? The, the, this artist, Tacita Dean, uh, thinks that there are things about it that are irreplaceable and that if we go into a completely digital future we will lost, have lost something. But I think the equivalent is with the invention of printing, we stopped writing on parchment and we moved into the world of paper. And something similar uh, like that is, is happening. So there's a piece of film. Uh, this image is the last film I worked on, uh, which we, we finished just two weeks ago, uh, directed by Phil Kaufman, uh, who did the right stuff. And uh, I worked with him on Unbearable Lightness of Being. Uh, this is the story of Ernest Hemingway and Martha Gellhorn, their marriage from uh, when they met, uh, 1935, 36, until 1946. Um, and ironically, it, it, because it's a completely digital uh, production, we shot with the Ari Alexa, it was a tapeless workflow, edited obviously uh, digitally on, on Final Cut Pro. Um, and then we made a digital intermediate, and that's still ongoing at the moment. Phil uh, tomorrow is doing some final tweaks to the digital intermediate. Um, but it, the film is a celebration of the tactility of film, which I don't think would have been achievable without the digitization of it, because we use uh, and we rely on and we use creatively um, archival footage uh, from the Spanish Civil War and the Sino-Japanese War, 1938, 39, 40, uh, Second World War, um, which comes from, to us from a huge variety of sources. Uh, we've been pulling this out of archives around the world for the last uh, year. And some of it's on nitrate 35 millimeter film, some of it's on 16 millimeter film that was been duped 15 times. Uh, some of it has an almost imperceptible grain structure, relatively speaking. Other has pieces of grain the size of tennis balls. And what we've done is um, integrate our actors. We've nested our actors into, selectively, into this footage so that you'll be looking um, at, you know, high definition, uh, 4K, Ari Alexa, uh, uh, material, and then so something will happen, and the film will plunge into this world of monochrome grain, um, and events will happen, usually uh, some kind of fighting, war, conflict going on, um, and then the story will take a turn, and they'll kind of come out of it. So we're diving in and out of this swimming pool filled with, uh, s uh, with film grain, um, celluloid, uh, sprockets, and then coming up into the world of the digital present. So it's been, it's been a fascinating journey. Um, I wish I could show you sections of it, but it's still being worked on. It, it was financed by HBO, so it'll be seen on HBO sometime next year. Uh, it'll be released theatrically in the rest of the world, the, the non-HBO part of the world. Um, so it, it, it is a, it's a feature film. Uh, it's as challenging and complex as any film I've worked on. Uh, it's just nobody uh, would make a film about Ernest Hemingway except HBO. Uh, it just gives you some idea of where the studios are. They, they, they said, effectively, they said, who's Ernest Hemingway? Not that they meant, <laughs> not that they meant that, although maybe, but uh, what they meant was, how can we sell this, you know? 
our audience doesn't know who Ernest Hemingway is. So this is one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is this. This is the entire timeline uh, in Final Cut of, um, uh, of the film. It's, uh, you know, it's well over two hours, and I edited it as a single file, so I, never, I didn't break it up into reels, um, which gives you some idea of the power of uh, the, com the way computers can work uh, today. Uh, because we did this, I exported all of this to the sound department at Lucasfilm, who did the mix on this, uh, and they mixed it in a single file, which is the first time they had done that. Um, so there was just one Pro Tools session, which was the whole film. Um, and there's lots to say about that, uh, about how that affects the creativity, both in the editing and the, uh, and in the sound work. But it, it, it is a small but profound shift in the way things are done. So we have uh, 22 tracks, video tracks, and 50 audio tracks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, divided up into bands. Uh, the first eight were dialogue. Uh, the next two were narration. The next four were mono sound effects. Then two tracks of mono sound effects with low frequency enhancement, th thuds. Um, then five stereo pairs of sound effects with, again, with low frequency enhancement. And then um, four stereo tracks of music with low frequency. Uh, what, what you're looking at right now actually is the, the final music by Javier Navarrete, um, the Spanish composer. Um, but we did a temp score, and over the course uh, of the film, we started shooting in March, and we finished mixing in, at the end of September. So it was a seven-month journey. Uh, but as we put the film together, the, um, um, we had a temp score, and then as Javier's music started to come in, one by one, the temp score got replaced. I think you can see some of these uh, over here. Uh, are, are grayed out. That's probably a temp score replaced by Javier's music. And then source music. It's a period film, and uh, we, we had a lot of uh, stuff, music being played in, in the world of the film. And then uh, we had uh, LCR effects premixes uh, at at as early as I could, uh, sometime in May, once I had the assembly together, um, I turned the sound over to Pete Horner, who was the sound designer on the film. And um, I had already put in sound effects, uh, you know, roughly scaffolding out the, uh, the landscape of sound and, and music. And then he would take sections uh, where we both felt, well, we need a little more precision here than I can do or than I have time to do. And so Pete would take a week or so and develop a uh, detailed soundscape for sections of the film. Uh, and then he would fold that back to me and I would put it in as an LCR, left, center, right um, thing. I was deriving low frequency uh, in, the, in showing the film. I was deriving that live uh, using a DBX uh, subharmonic synthesizer. This is another way to look at the film. Um, this is the, um, the FileMaker Pro database. Each of these uh, rectangles is a list of data, uh, all centering uh, really around this, which is the uh, list of shots. Uh, every shot gets its own record. Uh, but then we can tie all of these things into what scene does it belong to, what visual effects uh, relate to it, what music relates to it, what uh, source, uh, uh, what um, archival footage relates to it, and my photo system, which I'll talk about in a second, of extracting representative stills. Um, so 
Th this isn't time related, um, but it is a fundamental pillar and it, it really uh, has a lot to do with um, the database management, which on one level is very prosaic. On the other hand, it allows us to do the job. And now that everything, we've gone into this fungible world, um, cameras and sound recorders and the uh, visual effects house um, and the script supervisor, everyone is generating digital information, uh, media, and then information about that media, the, the, you know, the, the metadata. Let me just quickly go through, um, you know, I, I like to think of, of editing um, just to help me uh, grapple with the uh, sometimes uh, immensity of it as having three strands to it. There's the plumbing strand, which we've just uh, been talking about with database, which is how do you get here from there? How, how do you take this torrent of information and uh, direct it uh, to the right buckets uh, so you don't get drenched by it and at a moment's notice you can reach into that virtual seven tons of material and extract the single frame which weighs, you know, a hundredth of an ounce uh, and just <coughs> put it in the right place. Um, the writing part of editing, uh, we, I mentioned earlier the word montage. Uh, that's a French word for editing. Um, it talks about the putting together of the film, that you have to build a film. The montage is building, uh, constructing. Um, also, of course, there is the editing part, which is, all right, now you've got it together, what are you going to do to it to make it have its final? So we actually need a third word that combines both of those uh, tasks. But operationally, it's very similar to what you do when you write. You know, that famous thing about, you know, the editing is the final draft of the film is true. You know, we are dealing um, with another language. It's not words, it's images, it's duration, it's color, it's sound, uh, and how they all uh, go together to, over a duration of hour and a half or two and a half hours to tell an emotionally and intellectually engaging story. Um, and, you know, everything you bring to bear when you write something is brought to bear in the editing. It's just that you're not um, dealing with things, uh, with, with, with written symbols. You're dealing with more experiential uh, elements to it. And then performing is, um, you know, I, as, as some of you may know, I stand uh, to do what I do. Uh, to edit, I would recommend that you do that both for your own health, but I also think creatively it has an effect on what you do because editing is not like editing text, which is, I think, why we have been sitting. We, you know, the, when the Chems and Steenbecks came in, they were desks and you sat at them. And, you know, I, I started using the Steenbecks uh, and Chems in the late 60s, early 70s, and I thought they were great, but something began to bug me about them, which was sitting there, uh, because I earlier had stood to work on a moviola, and finally I just said, well, to hell with it, I'll, I'll put them up in the air. So I had plywood boxes made like this that put my chem up, and when I made the transition to digital in the, in the mid-90s, it, it was a no-brainer. I just uh, got an architect's table and... and uh, anyway, it's because you're on your feet like a... A musical conductor or like a cook uh, or like a brain surgeon. Um, all of these things are time dependent. You have to do things in a certain time and editing is very involved, as we all know, with time as a crucial factor, um, much more so than, than writing, which is, is timeless in a sense, or painting, which is just a single thing that you can at least get the sense of in a single glance. We shot, as I said, with the Arri Alexa. Uh, it's a wonderful camera. Uh, I haven't worked on a film that shot film since I worked on Jarhead, uh, which was uh, 2005. Everything I've done uh, since has been digitally captured. Um, the Arri, in my experience, is the best so far. 
And we had two cameras most of the time, sometimes three, sometimes four, but most of the time we had two. And the, it was a tapeless workflow, and this camera generated, the images that it generated were sent to a codex recorder, a um, little thing that sits on the back of the camera. And every day the codex material would be brought to us and downloaded into a big kind of uh, almost washing machine sized uh, uh, contraption that has 30 terabytes of material of storage in it. And so the original, let's call it the negative, goes in there and then um, kind of like a, a genie in a bottle, he says, what do you want? Uh, and I say, I want ProRes, yes, and it will generate ProRes from the master negative. And then we had to show the material to HBO over the internet through the PIX system we used. So we generated H.264 material that you know has a, a reasonable upload time. And then at, at the end of the film, we were generating the, the DPX frames, files, uh, which were sent to Deluxe, which is where we did the final uh, color timing. We uh, used Final Cut Pro 7. Um, you know, there's a lot to say about this big transition from 7 to 10. Um, this may be the last time that I'll use Final Cut Pro. I don't know what my next job is, nor do I know what system I'll use. It might be Final Cut. Seven, um, but you know, we're, I am, and most of us are, uh, at a juncture point who have been using Final Cut, and we have to really come to terms with uh, the the software and what it can do in the time uh, that it is being developed. Uh, we had five stations. Uh, I had one. The first assistant had two. The stock. Uh, footage uh, editor had one, and the second assistant had another one, uh, which was linked up with the, um, the codex machine. And we had 28 terabytes. A uh, large chunk of that was, you know, I don't know, 250 hours of uh, uh, stock footage that we had accumulated. Um, before I ever joined the project, the, the stock footage editor uh, uh, Rob Bonds was working on the film for a year before I ever joined it, doing all of the research uh, material. <clears throat> almost 2,000 shots in the finished film. Uh, almost 500 of those are fo uh, manipulated in some way. Um, about 250 in some way that you would uh, think of as a visual effect. Phil Tippett's studio. Uh, in Berkeley, he is an ex ILMer. He did the uh, the walkers in uh, Empire Strikes Back, uh, and founded his own uh, studio. And um, Chris Morley was the visual effects supervisor with us. And the the big challenge was finding how to get our actors nested in a pre-existing shot with, a pre with an existing grain structure and make it look convincing. We're, in the film, we're not obviously trying to make you think uh, this is reality, although it does have a compelling realistic feel because of the authenticity of the image. Uh, but there is a, a big uh, roller coaster ride of going from a highly granular structure world into a gra grainless digital world and then back again, something like uh, 16 times over the course of the film, uh, in and out, in and out. Um, and we celebrate that. It, it actually has a remarkable effect when you see it of this grain uh, coming in or going out uh, over the course of a shot. Almost a, a little over 250 were repositioned or blown up in some way. Um, this is a side effect of shooting digitally. Uh, that we have suddenly a great freedom uh, to recompose the image in some way, either by blowing it up or making a move on it or splitting it in half, uh, taking uh, performance from one take and combining it with another. Um, 
all of these, uh, these kind of things without it being noticed. There, there was a rule of thumb working in film that you couldn't make anything, uh, you couldn't blow up more than um, 120%, 100% being nothing, uh, the, the, the image as shot. So 100% is no blow up, 120 would be 20% larger. Uh, and beyond that, you started to see grain. Whereas with the Alexa footage, um, we were able to uh, take uh, a piece of film like this and blow it up that much, which is to say 240%, without it being noticeable. In fact, we went even further uh, because of our, uh, our roller coaster ride with grain. Um, the image starts to degrade uh, noticeably once you go past 240%, but you know, we were, we had footage in the film that was, you know, it, much more degraded than that from uh, 16 millimeter footage that was almost 80 years old. So I've got lots more to say. I realize I'm running out of time here. Well, <laughs> uh, hmm. let me uh, jump tracks then. This, uh, this little thing over here is the recorder that gets attached to the back of the film, uh, back of the camera. Um, and every day it came into our editing rooms and we downloaded it, uh, emptied it out into this machine. This is the kind of the, the washing machine I was telling you about. And um, that was our lab. That's this, this device is called the Codex Lab. Um, and theoretically, it does away with the necessity to send your footage uh, or your material to a real lab um, where they make copies that, you know, they give you the codec that you want and they sync it up and all of that. This machine does all of that. It, uh, as it turned out, uh, things are never as simple as uh, they're supposed to be, so this required um, a lot of babysitting at the beginning. HBO intends to use this on all of their films, but we were the guinea pigs for this, and we learned a lot uh, about the process. Um, it, it would, we would get metadata out of this uh, uh, material, obviously the image itself, but then all the data about the image, uh, from what lens did they use, uh, what was the f-stop, what was the color pack, uh, this, this whole concept of the uh, CDLs and the lookup tables uh, giving you a, a lifting you up from the raw uh, data which is captured uh, and then giving it a final tweak. Uh, the, the DP, uh, Roger Stoffer, a, a Dutch uh, guy, a man who lives in Los Angeles now, uh, he, at the end of every day, he would take what they shot that day and um, do his magic on it, giving it exactly the look that he wanted. So that, this information was uh, in there. We would transform this uh, XML into FileMaker Pro, which is the database I was showing you, friendly data, and then suck it into the, the database uh, that I have. Um, the same thing for the script supervisor. Um, she was working with a program called Script E that is all uh, on, on a laptop, uh, uses uh, a proprietary software, but generated XML, which we transformed into FileMaker uh, XML and then into the database. And then the sound, uh, same thing. Um, I won't get into this because I don't fully understand it, but this is the X XSL uh, uh, magic wand that gets waved that takes uh, output XML and turns it into input XML. Anyway, um, there was this shocking event that happened in June, um, which was the publication of Final Cut Pro 10, or X. 
Um, we'd been looking forward to it. Uh, I had been at Cupertino in February where we, it had been dangled in front of us um, and some of its strong points, the 64-bit processing uh, had been uh, laid out. Um, we were, it was a kind of a beta version. Um, and uh, then immediately after seeing that, I got plunged into the maelstrom of actually making a film uh, where you're working 14 hour days and you don't have time to really surface at all. And then suddenly it was June and Final Cut Pro got published. And uh, I quickly looked at it and said, I can't use this. If, if I wanted to use this on the film that I'm working on, I can't use it. So I began to wonder, what is the pro part of it? Um, because it didn't have XML. I, I depend absolutely, as you can kind of tell, on this, all of this metadata being, uh, having a home uh, and, and winding up in the right bucket. Uh, but it doesn't, didn't have XML. It didn't allow us, didn't have shared area network support. So we couldn't have multiple editors. And as you saw, I, you know, I have five workstations and everyone has to be able to open up the project which is on the, on the, the raid. Um, so I, I, I got confused by those two things which were one of a number of things that uh, um, made me and a lot of people wonder what, what's happening. And uh, so I wrote a letter to Apple uh, asking them that, basically saying, what, what's, what's happening? Um, <laughs> because along with publishing Final Cut 10, they end of life what I was working on. Um, meaning it was still there on my machine, I could still use it, but you couldn't buy it anymore. So if somebody wanted to add some more seats or the school wanted to add some more stations with Final Cut, officially, they couldn't do it. And so it, it, made, a, it made me and everyone wonder, what, what's the thinking behind this? Um, so it, it's, there was a period in uh, the Cold War when there was something called Kremlinology, uh, which was looking at the, who, was in, who was on the podium during the parade to try to figure out what were they doing back in there? Um, and so, you know, Apple, which is a very closed, uh, secretive um, company anyway, did this thing that didn't seem to make any sense. Um, and I still don't know what the real reason for this is. I think it had something to do with the schedule uh, that had been two years since the last, they last published anything on Final Cut. And there had been this decision made to completely revamp the software and make it um, worthy of building a, a foundation worthy of, of sustaining development over the next 10 years. Um, the, the final cut that we've been working with and love um, has its faults and some of those faults are simply the result of having been the, the base code of it having been written in the late 1990s. Um, so, um, they, they, in a sense, they had to, they couldn't wait any longer. They had to publish it even though it wasn't ready. Um, but simultaneously um, killing the thing that was workable is, is, was a confusing thing. Anyway, um, uh, we started a, a dialogue um, and I sent them a list of, you know, Here's, here's my list, I'm sure everyone else is sending you this, but my list was XML, please get this uh, working, because this allows, you know, there's that thing of uh, when your kid's at school and the report card comes and it says, uh, does not play well with other people. <laughs> <laughs> and that was kind of, you know, now, you know, this lovely kid, uh, a final cut was like being a problem child. <laughs> so um, uh, XML allows you to play with other people and 
shared area network uh, allows you to play collaboratively in, in the editing process. External monitoring, which I absolutely depend on, was not supported. Please uh, support this. Uh, what's my, where's my list? Um, you weren't able to open your previous programs in the new program. So I was like, you know, imagine Word saying, no, we've redesigned word processing. You'll love this, but you can't open all of your, any of your old documents, uh, which is another, what? <laughs> kind of a thing. Um, because of the, uh, one of the major redesigns was the lack of any tracks. You, you saw that uh, slide I put up where I had 50 soundtracks that I don't technically need 50. I could have condensed all of that to maybe 20 um, if I scrunched it. But by, ha by taking advantage of the fact that Final Cut has 99 tracks, uh, I'm able to apportion the material in bands just to, to give myself a handle on what's happening here. Oh, they, yeah, that's, this is dialogue, there's sound effects. And I can channel those to a, uh, a, um, a little mixing board and selectively raise or lower the levels of those in, in real time. Um, there was no way to do that in the new Final Cut. Everything just came out. You couldn't selectively choose uh, what to do. Um, tape, they no longer supported tape in and out. And on this film was tapeless, but the previous film was very, very definitely taped, so what would I do? Um, anyway, uh, there has been a new version of, of, of Final Cut 10, which goes some distance to addressing some of these problems. It does have XML, uh, it does have shared area network support, it does have external monitoring, it does have assignable tracks, not in the same way, not 50 tracks with um, uh, divisions in between them, but a freeform thing where you can assign each, you can tell each clip what it is. You are dialogue, you are sound effects, and then hopefully the audio will go in, in the right direction. <laughs> and um, it, it does not yet, um, let's see if I can show something here. I'll just skip ahead. Uh, this is, that's my editing room. That's what I saw every day when I came in. Um, I stand, as you can see, if you do stand to do, if, uh, if you take that challenge, uh, get this little thing, this just a little stool. Um, I was at a department store once a number of years ago and I looked around behind the counter because the, the salespeople are there, stand on their feet all day, and there's usually one of these there which allows you to put one foot up on a stool which takes your back and keeps it from doing that. So it just, it rotates your lower back um, out, um, and then you can change foot over the course of the day. And, you know, I, I worked long hours, uh, 14 hours was not at all unusual, but I'm not standing for 14 hours, because at some, you know, I have to do desk work, I have to make phone calls. And, but, but at the moment of actually editing, doing the, deciding where to cut, those crucial moments, I, I just, I cannot sit. I, I just, uh, um, anyway, it's, uh, it's, it's, I think, creatively good and healthier for you. Um, the, um, that's the sound system. I, I work in a 3.1 environment. Um, so there's an LCR speakers here. And then this box, this cube over here, here where this, this guy is the point one. Um, I, I put the dialogue coming out of the center speaker, and the uh, music comes out of left and right, and uh, the sound effects, atmospheric sound effects, but come out of left and right, stereo, but pinpoint sound effects, like a knock on the door or you know, uh, gunshots, that kind of stuff. Close shots would, be, would come out of the center, and it gives you uh, along with the low frequency mm, where you feel the sound, it gives you a really close 
analogy to what the finished soundtrack uh, will, will be. We, um, um, we took a copy of that, a 3.1 soundtrack, and, and made quick times of it, and had that uh, exported to Pro Tools, and we had that at, in the mixing studio um, when we were doing the final, in, which is in 5.1, with, with many, many more uh, sound effects and much more detail than I could really cope with uh, just in terms of time. Um, but we were able to you know, go back and forth from uh, here's, here's the Final Cut Pro output and uh, here's what we're mixing now. And aside from the fact that there weren't surrounds, it was a pretty good, it held up. Um, and we had screenings for HBO uh, where we ran just the 3.1 sound at a big theater uh, at, at ILM uh, with a 50-foot screen. Um, and it, you know, it sounded like a movie. Um, I, sh I should mention also just another thing about the, the where we're at, kind of the death of film aspect of it, is that we were showing the ProRes output from Final Cut at ILM on a 50-foot screen, and it looked great. <laughs> it just looked great. Um, there was no pixelation, no artifacting. Only if you were really looking in some smoky scenes, you would see that banding, uh, you know, at, at, at subtle gradations of uh, light in, in smoky areas, you'd see that. But um, it even got to the point that even after we were doing the first generation of the DI, we had a, a screening of the DI um, but certain shots were still being cooked on by the visual effects house. So I took the DI and we made a, a ProRes version of the DI. Um, and I was cutting in these new shots. Uh, and again, it was just, you know, perfectly transparent uh, experience. Anyway, uh, there, you know, the, the, the folks at Apple are certainly aware of the turmoil that, that has happened um, and are saying they are dedicated to uh, making Final Cut be a true, making it true to its word that it really is a professional uh, item. Um, I think the key to maybe seeing what into the future, they, they don't talk other than saying, yes, we'll have multicam in January, but you know, there's clearly been a big shift at Apple over the last 10 years, that Apple uh, was on a kind of life support for a while, sustained in the early part, parts of this decade, uh, the last years of the last century, by the professional market. And we professionals like very much uh, how Apple, how the Macintosh worked, how it processed graphic information. Um, and uh, we made a lot of noise about it and bought a lot of this stuff. I mean, we, as the, the culture, um, but starting with the iPod and the iPhone and now the iPad, Apple has broadened out into a truly mass market um, uh, creature. I was, as I said, I was just in London uh, the other, uh, just last week, and I, you know, as a as a common experience, I'd be walking past two guys, two two builders uh, doing cement work or something, uh, and they they're taking a break and they're sitting there, you know, and they're looking at something, and I peered over the edge, and they were both on their iPhones. Uh, so, you know, th this, this stuff has deeply penetrated into the culture and there is a wedge of a, uh, a world opening up who, is, who are now getting access to the grammar of film, which has been part of our experience, those of us working professionally for as long as we've been doing it, but this is uh, broadening out into the culture with unforeseen consequences. Um, but 
the, it's important, and rather, but, and it's important to make uh, this stuff easily accessible to people who are experiencing it for the first time. Um, there's a decision to, um, at Apple to, to kill uh, Express, which was kind of the mid-market, uh, and make Final Cut Pro uh, work at that level and hopefully with XML and with uh, working with third-party vendors to be able to use that as a foundation to rebuild a professional ecosystem um, which, uh, you know, the, as the Supermates demonstrate, is, is a very viable uh, and, and very active uh, part of the whole, the whole experience. So uh, I, I'm encouraged by uh, the developments that have happened in the last month. Uh, in s September, this new version was published. It's still some way to go. I haven't used it in any real world situation. I, as I said, I just finished a film and, and when you're on a film, you're kind of, making the film is about as much as you can ever do. Uh, so I, I wasn't able to then, to take some time out and, and really get my hands on it. That will be the, you know, the proof of the pudding is in the eating of it. It it's, doesn't matter what people say. It's like, how does it really feel when you, when you start to deal with it? Um, so uh, I'm cautiously optimistic, but still a little traumatized by uh, what happened over the summer. Because it, it makes you, you start to wonder what, you know, do they love us? No. <laughs> you know, uh, they're, you know, they like us and they say they love us. And, <laughs> uh, um, but, I mean, there's, there's um, I, I'm a big fan, as you can tell, of, of FileMaker. And there are some things about FileMaker that, you know, if we were trying to toss a football into the future and say, where is this really going, uh, I, I would, there, there are two things about FileMaker that I would love to see implemented um, in video editing software, whether it's Avid or Final Cut or, or Adobe, it uh, uh, doesn't really matter. But I, 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 with FileMaker, you are, you are given access to the layout layer. So you can peel back the skin and get your hands on the architecture underneath, and you can recombine that architecture however you want. You change the font of this, change the size of this window, make this thing do whatever you want. Um, so you can customize your car, in a sense, um, much more deeply than the, the different views uh, that are available to us in, in editing software. So something like that uh, would be fantastic. Uh, Fundamentally, editing software is, is three things together. It's a database, a clock, and a graphics program. Of course, it's easy to say that, but those are the three pillars that any editing software is. So if it's a database, give us access to the layout layer, and you, meaning Apple or Adobe or Avid, will save yourselves a ton of headaches because we won't have to keep phoning you or pounding on you, we, we can, if we're interested, we can do it ourselves. Um, anyway, let me uh, open things up for questions. Um, I've got some cards here. I can, I can take a crack at, at these. Michael, how are we doing time-wise? We're doing okay. <laughs> so, will editing ever be done by robots? If so, when? If not, <laughs> if not, why not? <laughs> well, it is kind of being done by robots. Uh, in you know, XML is a kind of robot. Um, we were able in FileMaker to um, to have our uh, metadata. Here, here are the shots that were shot yesterday, and we were able in in XML to write to arrange those shots in a certain order in the database and then export that information as an XML 
and that would trigger an event within, file, uh, within Final Cut, and it would make a sequence of all the shots in the right order with appropriate amounts of black in between each shot with metadata information about what that shot was. Um, and you know that's a job that would normally be done by an assistant. Okay, take the shots and string them out along the timeline. Now it's just thunk, and it happens automatically. Uh, at the creative level, uh, no, I, I think we're still safe there. Uh, although, you know, with the spreading of the internet and the flattening of the world, um, we all have to watch out for very talented editors in India and China who can eat our lunch uh, over the internet. Um, it, it is conceivable to see uh, film editing outsourced. A lot of visual effects work and certainly a huge amount of animation is already being outsourced. So, um, you know, the, the computers, the fungibility of uh, information is a great thing, but it also has this other edge to it that uh, has unknown um, consequences. Final cut, 10, yes, no, well, I did sort of answer that question. I, uh, a cautious, you know, a blinking yellow light. Um, uh, how do you approach your job creatively? How do you, um, when is it time to walk away for a while? Um, that's, you know, when, when you are working intensely 14 hours a day um, for seven months as, as we did and, and sometimes double that on a film, uh, you do get shack wacky, uh, <laughs> just the, after a while, it just becomes <laughs> So you do need um, a way to pull back. Uh, one of the, the techniques that I use uh, is to, um, when, I l when I look at dailies, uh, I'm, I'm seeing this, these images for the first time, and that's the only time I'll ever see them for the first time. They were shot yesterday. I'm seeing them today, or they were shot two hours ago, and I'm seeing them in the evening, whatever it happens to be. Uh, but that's a very precious moment, and it's easy to squander it, um, because that's the audience is going to see these images for the first time once, and that's as close as you will ever come to what they will experience. So my trick is to sit there in the dark with the, this laptop and I turn the screen off and I have FileMaker, I wrote this little program that is, that, and, I, and I just type in the dark, lots of mistakes, but roughly correct, of anything that I'm thinking. How, how do I feel uh, if I think banana for some reason? I don't censor that, I write banana. Um, and two months later, oh yeah, that's the banana take. Uh, actors use this as a trick uh, or a skill in casting sessions. They'll wear a funny hat or, you know, a pin or a something uh, that just is unusual, distinguishing them really almost arbitrarily from everyone else because, again, you, when a, a casting director sees 50 actors in a day, that's kind of like me looking at 50 takes of a scene after a while. It was take 36 better than take 18? Oh yeah, that was the banana one. Um, so uh, but I, I have those and I have access to those. I print them out um, and look at them two or three or four months later. And I can, I, it does clear the fog a little bit. It gives me access to some essential truth about what I'm doing. And then, yeah, getting up and walking away, that's the great thing about editing. Uh, as a director, you really can't do that. You, you are there. Um, and, you know, there are little techniques for getting, giving yourself some space, but basically, that's it. Whereas an editor uh, can, uh, you know, work an extra half hour, uh, but then somewhere in the middle of the day, go out and take a half hour walk and just kind of think things over. 
how do you know if a scene works or doesn't? Um, well, uh, it's kind of the same sort of thing, but it's, uh, you have to see things in context. Uh, a scene may work on itself, but it may not work in the film. And these are the most difficult kinds of, you know, that, that middle part of the, the three braid, the writing part, is being able to say, you know, this is a really perfectly good scene, but we have to take it out or move it somewhere else in the film for the good of the film, for the good of the whole. And it's very dangerous uh, to, to preemptively uh, uh, make a strike into the film before you've seen the whole film together. You, as you're editing the film, you have to really keep, you obviously have to have opinions about what you're looking at and what you're doing, but you have to keep those opinions under control um, and uh, just say, okay, I don't really agree with the direction this scene is going, but I don't know. Uh, it, in the larger context, it may be great. Uh, so, you know, hold back, do, give it the best shot that you can, um, and then once you see it in the larger context, then you can tell whether it's working or not. But even that's a fine line, um, and you can get into huge uh, discussions with uh, the studio and even with the director about, you know, is this scene um, serving the larger purpose of the film? Is there one piece of advice about sound to impart to student sound designers? Um, always go further than you think you can go. Um, the, the try to, to let's say, the, the literalness of an event. Uh, there's a certain compelling quality to being literal about things, but try mostly to bend that literalness to something else. Um, because really what you're trying to do is light a fire in the mind of the audience. And literalness doesn't do that. Uh, it's important occasionally to be literal because that's sort of the ground. But most of the time you, you want to um, levitate the film. Um, just the, the act of walking is, a, is an act of controlled imbalance. If we try to be balanced all the time when we're walking, we wouldn't do it. So we shift to the left and then to the right and then to the left. The moments of true balance or literalness are very few, but that's what keeps us moving forward. And by the same token, the, the, the let's call it the metaphorical use of film sound is something that can really propel a film forward because it it ignites the audience's imagination without them really being aware of it, which uh, is one of the most powerful things you can do. Um, you know, they, that doesn't, they, they subconsciously, their mind thinks, that doesn't really fit, but why, oh, oh I get it, it's mm, something. You, so you, you gain, gain an image or a concept uh, which is the sum of two slightly different things. And that is particular and unique to every member of the audience. That's the, uh, the, my, the phrase I like to use about the experience of seeing a film is mass intimacy. You know, we want to appeal to thousands, millions of people, um, but we want to appeal to everyone in a unique way where that person says, how does this film know that about me? And they don't even really formulate it that specifically. It's just, I love this film. Um, but it's because that film seemed to talk to them about some secret that only they know. Uh, but that's particular to each person. And the reason it's particular is that the film has suggested things and not literally demonstrated them. And they have put it together themselves in their own unique way. Um, so that's the intimate, intimate part of the experience. Uh, conception and workflow change since going digital? Yeah, but not, you know, as, as we had that quote from uh, uh, Victor Fleming, you know, essentially it's the same. 
Um, I did a remastering of the conversation uh, 10 years ago now. Uh, it's just come out on Blu-ray, or, or it's coming out on Blu-ray three days from now. Um, but it's that, that remaster is, is now been, been Blu-rayed. Uh, but I, I, that was a film I edited in the early 70s, and here I was in the early noughts, or whatever we call it, and uh, 30 years later. And I had it up on the Avid, and I was kind of looking at it, thinking, well, I, no, I, I was mostly just uh, doing uh, subtle, uh, we, we were adding the music, we'd found the original stereo recordings of David Shire's music, and so we were adding those back. And, but, you know, I was thinking, well, will I make this different today? And I wouldn't. Uh, there, there wasn't anything that, that made me think, oh, uh, I wish I would have done something different there. So, the, the, what you do physically is very, very different, but what you're thinking as you do it is, is pretty much the same. Um, what are you thinking about these days? Um, well, <laughs> I was just, I've been reading a book uh, uh, by this neuro, 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 neurologist, neurophysicist, uh, whatever they're called these days, by Ramachandran, uh, who te teaches at the University of San Diego in California. Um, and he, he, was, he was trying a very difficult thing, which is to think about the neurology of creativity. And he mentioned uh, many things in the course of uh, talking about this, but one in particular intrigued me, which was an experiment that was done with, of course, a rat, uh, our friend the rat, uh, in a cage with a square and a rectangle, a rectangle being 166 aspect ratio. And the rat, if the rat went to the square, nothing happened. If it went to the 166 rectangle, it got some food. And all day, every day for a week, and eventually the rat, of course, just put the rat in the cage and it made a beeline for the rectangle and it got some food. The next day, uh, the eighth day, the square was gone and it was replaced by a 235 rectangle. And the rat came into the cage and looked and made a beeline for the 235 rectangle, <laughs> thinking, if I got that much food from this rectangle, <laughs> this other one, which is even more rectangular, must really give me food. Um, so he, he made analogies to how human beings uh, relate, and um, specifically, you know, advertisers are basically playing this trick on us all the time. They're finding something to which we are, some rectangularity to which we are sensitive somewhere up here and increasing that and we go for it. Uh, you know, with fast food, it's salt, fat, sugar. Uh, these are rectangles that were in short supply in our Stone Age years and are abundant now, but we still are programmed to go for the maximum, even though it's bad for us. Um, so it, it, there's a, there's a you know, what is it that makes us value something of which we have no experience yet? That rat has never had the 235 experience. It all, it associates food only with the 166 rectangle, so why doesn't it go there? Because rectangularity is somehow in the brain as an abstract thought. And that's an interesting thing to think about. You know, animals, a rat, having the abstract, almost platonic ideal of re rectangularity as a value and that it will go for it. Well, that's it, that's it. All right, uh, yeah. Uh, the, the question is, what about 3D? I, I got into, well, not trouble, but uh, <laughs> there was a, I, I wrote a letter to Roger Ebert, just a personal letter. I, I was supposed to talk at one of his Ebert thons in Chicago a couple of years ago, and I couldn't go because of the volcano that blew up in Iceland. Uh, I was in Europe at the time, so we 
you know, exchanged emails, and I, uh, he, he wrote a review of Green Hornet or Lantern, one of whichever one was in 3D, and uh, I wrote about my own experience editing 3D, which was on uh, Captain EO, that Michael Jackson film uh, that uh, Francis Coppola directed for Disneyland in the mid 80s. And I, uh, I was happy to have done it. I, as a kid, I was a big fan of 3D comics, and you know, I thought this is the future, but it was a future that didn't happen. And there was a wave of 3D in the 80s, and it didn't happen, and we're in the middle of a wave now. One thing I observed uh, at the time, uh, which is that um, when you look at something in the real world, uh, this bottle, I, my eyes, like a lens, focus at four feet away, but my eyes also tip in, they converge at four feet. So there's that, you know, if, if this is the base of a triangle, then this is a tip. And if I look further away, that opens up. My eyes open up because the tip of the uh, triangle is further away. So, but the point is we're always looking at and converging, we're focusing and converging at the same point. And millions of years of evolution has been this way. When we look at 3D films, we're doing something different, which is that we're focusing at the plane of the screen. That's where the image is, actually. So we have to focus there, and you back there may be 100 feet from that screen. So you're focusing at 100 feet, but the thing comes out of the screen and it's 12 feet in front of you. So you have to focus at 100 feet and converge at 12 feet. And then maybe the opposite. You focus at 100 feet and you converge at 200 feet. And we can do it, otherwise 3D films wouldn't work. So we can do it, but it's like uh, you know, running a complex video on the laptop that the fan turns on. <laughs> and, uh, and there's the equivalent of that. We get, we get headaches, uh, some of us, uh, because we're doing something that we haven't been programmed to do, and we're trying to do it. We're being good soldiers. Okay, we'll do it. Um, but it's hard, and, and the, the film also can abuse you of that. One of the things that we had to do in Captain EO was to make sure that at the cut point, that point of convergence was the same on the incoming shot as it was in the outgoing shot, so that we didn't fool around with people too much. Because if it isn't, then at the cut point, the br you don't know where to look. And it takes a couple of, well, many frames for you to figure out, oh, there it is. And by then, you've lost a lot of information, and your brain has had to do that extra work. So this is a profound problem, and I don't know what the answer to it is. Uh, there are other more superficial problems, which is that the, sc the screen is low by a camera stop or two. Uh, it's, the light is diminished at the projector, and then it's diminished in turn by the glasses you're wearing. And so the, the images are dark. And the, um, the uh, point at which moving things will strobe is sooner. You know, I, Michael Jackson would dance to his moonwalk across the stage, and in 2D it would look fine. When I saw it in 3D, he would chatter. It would go tick, 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 across the stage. I don't know why. It has something to do with the fact that our minds are paying a lot of attention to the edges of things. And in 2D, you kind of say, oh, it's something like this. And so you, you, your mind lets it smear. Whereas in 3D, because dimension is determined by the edges of things and aligning them, you're paying a lot of attention. And therefore, you see the strobing that's always there. It's, it's not like the strobing isn't there. It is in 2D, but the mind just kind of says, oh, it's OK. You, you know, you don't see it uh, because of the way our uh, processing works. And uh, anyway, there, there are a number of problems like that that are solvable. If we increase the frame rate, as Peter Jackson is doing, to 48 frames a second, maybe that will uh, smooth, 
out this strobing quality, and if you doubled the light coming from the projector, you would compensate. But all of these things are expensive, and um, you know, we'll see. We'll see. It's uh, it's challenging. The question is, if I didn't use Final Cut, what would I do? Um, I started uh, using the Avid in 1994, 95. Um, I'm very comfortable with Avid. Uh, I was uh, called in to help finish the cut on Wolfman, uh, the Vinicio del Toro film. So I worked for a number of months. They were cutting on the Avid, so I just cut on the Avid. So. Um, there are some very good things about Avid um, that Final Cut doesn't have and vice versa. Um, so Avid is an option. I'm, I'm curious about Premiere just uh, because I'm curious about technology. And uh, one last thing, uh, which is how many of you have backed up your computers? <laughs> good. <laughs> it's the hook on this fan. <laughs> That's but why I we must. got him for the raffle. So please thank <laughs> Walter.